Welcome back to part two of a four-part lecture on the International Project Assignment. In this video, I'm going to introduce you to the resources that you need to complete part one of your assignment. This is a video that you may want to work as you watch. Um, if you have a computer in the classroom or a tablet, you might want to attempt to bring up the resources on your screen as we discuss them. And also, feel free to stop this video lecture if at any time things start to move too quickly. So for part one of your paper, you're going to select a product, research HTS codes and Schedule B codes. After reviewing the tariff pages, you're going to decide on how much you're going to ship um, and what information needs to be reported on the documents, and you're going to make a note of the duty rate and learn which countries have trade agreements in place that cover those products. Um, you're also going to find out whether or not the product requires a license and set up your supply chain. And this, all this information is on your checklist. Now for those of you who will be following along on your own computers in the classroom, I would recommend that you stop the video and go to these specific websites. Um, these websites are provided for you so that you don't have to struggle finding the resources. Um, when you work in international business, you use these type of resources every day so it would be a good idea for you to save them in your um, favorites in your browser so please stop the video and load these websites into your browser if you wish to follow along Okay, if you have not selected a product at this point, let's take a moment to explore how, my, how you might be able to do that quickly. Obviously, you can also always select a product with which you work now in your career that can make the project really more interesting. You can look through the tariff and pick up a product from the tariff, and I'll show you the tariff in a bit. Um, you can always select a product from the commerce control list, but I'll warn you, if the second you select a product, on the commerce control list your project just became a lot harder and certainly it is not a requirement to deal with any of the econ the commodities that are listed on that list and then of course you can always pick a product that you purchased recently or that you buy regularly um, and sometimes that can make for an interesting project as well so let's say that i'm importing uh taco bell monster eyeball straws now, <laughs> you probably think I'm crazy for selecting that product, but let me tell you why. When I'm creating a video and explaining how to do something, I need to pick something that is so strange that there's a very, very small chance that one of my students will attempt to select that product for their project. But of course, this um, makes a very clear point. Although I've never had a student tell me that that's going to be the product that they selected for import, um, there is a place in the code, in, in the tariff, where you can have this thing properly classified. So just so that you realize that I'm not making this up, here is the video for Taco Bell, I'm, Taco Bell Monster Eyeball Straws from 1997. Come on, finish the video.
Okay, so that is my proof that I didn't make this up. So the, the one thing that I need to clarify with you before we get started on the classification process is that if you're going to be importing a commodity, like I'm going to be importing my Taco Bell Monster eyeball straws, I'm going to refer to my commodity code as an HTS number. If you're going to be exporting it, then you're going to be referring to your commodity code as a Schedule B number. So keep those straight in your head. It's still a good idea to start with a harmonized tariff system because it's just easier to work with and it's more common. But once you have your HTS code, it's quite possible that your Schedule B number will be exactly the same. Um, Another word on the HTS codes and the Schedule B numbers, the government can change those. Um, so about once a year, you might want to look at your, you know, at the beginning of every year, you might want to look at your commodity codes if you are dealing in international business and make sure that you're using the proper um, codes um, when they reissue the tariffs. Now the first site that we're going to go to is this first one, um, which is at the U.S. International Trade Commission. And you will see that there are all sorts of ways to look up an HTS code on this website. Um, if you click on this link, this is the, Uni uh, the United States International Trade Commission. If you scroll down and you click on this link, you can download the full edition of the tariff. I'm not going to do that right now because it's almost 4,000 pages. But I do download a copy at the beginning of every year so that I have an offline copy available. Um, you can also click on this link and look at the tariff by chapter. And you can also come in over here to this search field and um, enter the name of the product here and have the system search for you. Now I'm going to click on the chapter option so that we can examine how the tariff is set up. Now you will see that each chapter provides for a different class of commodities. Now although you cannot legally rely upon the chapter titles as a guide for selecting HTS codes, it does help that they attempt to put them all into groups. And as we scroll through the tariff, you will see that there are 99 chapters of commodity codes. Some are temporary, but most are permanent. And like I said, the government has the right to update the tariff and change the numbers every year, so it's always a good idea to recheck your numbers. Um, but Customs does try um, to maintain a certain level. They do try to um, maintain a certain level of consistency year to year. So I'm going to come over to this search param, this search bar right here, and I'm going to enter the word straw. After all, that would be a likely place to start when importing Taco Bell Monster Eyeball Straws. Now, you will see that there is an entire list of, of um, straw products that appear in the tariff. Anywhere the word straw appears, it's going to pull it up right here, okay? Now when we go through the list, we see poppy straw, cereal straw, bamboo straw. We see, if we scroll down a little further, concentrates of poppy straw, artificial straws. Um, there's even down here boards and panels and ties um, and tiles made with straw harvesting and threshing machinery that processes straw, but there are no Taco Bell Monster Eyeball Straws. So I'm just going to go and select a page. We'll look at Poppy Straws. Um, because it is the first item, it, it doesn't matter which page we use because all the tariff pages are set up relatively um, the same. And we'll scroll down to 1211 because that is where they tell us that Poppy Straw is. And again, every page in the tariff is set up the same way. So the first column is the tariff number. And every country that is part of the harmonized system uses the same number here. The next column includes numbers that are set up by the individual countries. And the individual con countries can use these numbers any way that they want to. So under the 1211 tariff, um, the tariff number, um, it describes the product. So if we go up here and look at what 1211 actually refers to, it refers to plants and parts of plants, including seeds and fruit, a kind used primarily in perfumery, in pharmacy or for insecticidal, fungicidal, or similar purposes, fresh or dried, whether or not cut, crushed or powdered. Now the reason why I read that to you is to, to give you an example of how specific the tariff actually is. 
it goes into an enormous amount of detail. So when you're classifying something, make sure you read all the different headings and make sure that you're selecting the right number. Now when we scroll down here to 12, 11, 40, where we see poppy straw appears in this section, we can see now that Customs wants us to tell them how many kilograms um, we will be importing. And so that tells us right now, right at this moment, that we're going to have to show kilograms on our commercial invoice when we bring them here to the United States because Customs wants to know how many kilograms. But we also see that there's no duty rate on poppy straw, that that's free. And that's good for us because now we can pretty much say we're not going to use a trade agreement because one of the main reasons you would apply a trade agreement would be to save import tax. Well, if you're not paying tax, there's really no reason to do that. But look at mint leaves. Mint leaves, there's a certain type of mint leaf that has a 4.8% tax. But if you get it from these countries over here, it's free. So this is a good example of when you would want to use a trade agreement. If you can buy your mint from one of these countries, it would be worth it to you because you would save the 4.8% duty rate. Now, for our purposes, we're going to ignore this column here to the right. Um, this tariff rate applies to countries that we're not supposed to be doing business with anyway, like North Korea, Cuba, or Iran. Um, and so if we were to arrange for a shipment to come in from those countries, um, the duty rate would apply, uh, would, th that would be applied would be 25%. Okay, so let's go back and talk about Taco Bell Monster eyeball straws. Okay, we know that we don't have a tariff classification because we've gone through the full list of where every mention of the word straw is in the tariff and it's not in there. So the next question we ask ourselves is, has anyone ever tried to import this? And if so, did customs prepare a ruling on the classification? And if you find that your product is not in the tariff, then you would proceed to the cross ruling system. And the ruling system is at this website here, rulings.cbp.gov. So let's take a look at this. All right, I'm gonna click on here, go back to the start page, which is what you would see. All right. Now when you get to the ruling system, there's a search bar, and if you type in Taco Bell eyeball straws or your product, you will see that Customs did prepare a ruling on this, specifically for Taco Bell. And if you click on the document and open up the ruling, you will see that they actually went into some pretty significant detail um, regarding this classification. Now the funny thing is, is that in a lot of cases when you're requesting a ruling from customs you need to provide a sample so customs writes um, alliance customs clearance back and the one of the first things they mention is a sample of the eyeball straw was submitted with your letter the straw which is composed of an unspecified plastic material is twirled the plastic eyeball is securely fitted with a plastic eye socket, which in turn is securely fitted to the straw. The straw is functional. The eyeball straw will be distributed in Taco Bell restaurants as a promotional item. The applicable subheading for the eyeball straw will be the subheading 39173260. They actually gave her the classification number. And if you read further along in that paragraph, um, they also will tell her that the plastic straws so classified are subject to a general rate of duty of 3.1% ad valorem, which means 3.1% based upon the value. So when, you don't, when you're not sure of which classification number to use in the tariff, you would write customs and ask for their assistance, and then the ruling would be published in the cross system where you could get a classification. So between the tariff and the cross system, we are usually able to find a code that will work. So here's some general rules with the trade agreements. If, you, if your duty rate on your product is free, you probably won't use a trade agreement. If you have a duty rate, you want to consult the Office of the U.S. Trade Agreement to see if there's any particular details, and that information, you, with that information, um, you would go to the website for the U.S. Trade Representative, click on Trade Agreements, and then Free Trade Agreements, and it will list the details on the trade agreements for, with, um, 
with the countries with which we trade that are under these trade agreements. And right now we have 20 that are in force. And another good source for res research on the trade agreements, um, the Global Edge website, and that's at the Michigan State University. And you can also find out a lot of stuff about the industry when you look at this as well. So let's say that you select industry. After you have found a tariff number that you think is right, you're going to click on the tariff on the, the buy industry button and hopefully this will come up fairly quickly. If not, we'll skip this and we will come back to it. But if you click on industry, on the right hand side of the screen, there is a blank there where you can enter the tariff number. And of course, Customs gave us the tariff for the straws of 3917. So if you're working on your own, on your own computer, you probably see that block to the right. So if you enter, there it is, you're going to get a list of industries. And then under your HTS code, if you enter 3917, you will see that the same classification number, tubes, pipes, hoses, and fittings, that's where Customs told us to classify it. When it comes to export, this is where we're sending most of those types of products. And if you want to see who our major trading partners are, or who our major trading partners are um, under this commodity, um, you can click on import, and we can see that these are the countries um, that provide most of those 3917 items. Okay. So we went through several steps on getting the HTS number. But for those of you who are going to be exporting, you need a Schedule B number. Now, if you recall, I mentioned that you can start with the HTS number, but then you need to confirm it as the appropriate number. So in this case, when we go to Census and we look at the Schedule B numbers, let me back this up. You're going to go to a page that looks similar to this. When you enter the first four digits of your tariff classification number 3917 and you go down to the section that customs that you found in the tariff, you click on this and as long as um, the tariff is basically the same, you're going you're gonna to stick with that number 391732. 391732, there's the number and it's described basically the same way. Okay, it's still under 3917 tubes, pipes and hoses and fittings thereof um, of plastic. So it's still under the same heading. Okay, so in the case of the Taco Bell eyeball straws, it doesn't matter if I'm importing or exporting. The number is still going to appear to be the same. Okay, so now we're going to look at licensed commodities. Now, I can guarantee you that no one is going to use a Taco Bell monster eyeball, eyeball straw as a weapon against the military. But I still want to show you the commerce control list. This list contains the names of the commodities that cannot be exported without a license. I will say at this point that exporting anything on this list might result in a prison sentence as well as a monetary fine if you do not have the appropriate license. So it is important to remember that this list is out there. So let's look at this commerce control list. Let's see if we've got it here. All right, let me copy this real quick. Let's see if we can pull it up. This is in a PDF format. Now, it's going to take a second to open it up. Okay, when we open it up, the first thing you want to keep in mind is that this is an index. There's a set of regulations that go into a lot more detail on this. I'm looking to, looking to see if it's opened up yet. Okay. Um, and most of the items that are listed on the Commerce Control List are technical in nature, um, but, that does, but don't, don't take that for granted. Okay, here is the alphabetical index to the commerce control list. Because I want to show you, I want to show you um, some of the products that are considered technologically advanced that are on this list. Let's look at global positioning. Now we know our military uses global positioning, but we use global positioning on our cell phones, on our iPads, on our GPS systems, on our cars. Um, we even use global positioning when we chip the, our pets to make sure that we can find them. 
But here it's saying that those have those systems have an ECCN number or an export control number, 7A005, 7A105, or 7A994. And so before you send something out of the country like that, you want to make sure that you check it out with the Defense Department, DOD, to make sure that it's acceptable. Now, if you really want to learn how to do military-grade exports, you want to look at the international traffic in arms regulations. So you might want to make a note of that. Um, that has a lot to do with this list. Um, if something appears on this list, then it does fall under the control. It could potentially fall under the control of the Defense Department. Um, but if you're on this list, the first thing that you're going to do is you're going to re you're going to contact um, the Commerce Department through the Bureau of Industry and Security and see if a license is required. Again, that department is called Bureau of Industry and Security. Um, they handle a lot of regulation when it comes to things that shouldn't go out of the country and things that are that have a civilian application as well as a military application. Okay, so another one that might surprise you that's on here, analog to digital converters. They're also controlled and may require a license um, from the Commerce Department. If we look at aircraft parts, these could be civilian or military they have a potential to require a license even if we, and this is really not a surprise, if we um, put in body armor, um, armor plates, those are controlled, body armor, hard and soft, that's controlled. If we're looking at um, optical fibers, and these are things that are in our lives on a civilian level, but also may have a significant military application as well, so those are controlled. When we look at um, cameras, whoops, spelled it wrong. Okay, underwater cameras, still cameras, those are controlled. Um, radiation hardened TV cameras, they are controlled. Uh, scanning cameras and systems, they have a control number. Solid state cameras. Um, even something like television cameras that go underwater, um, those are also controlled as well. So not all the control commodities are on this alphabetical list, um, but it is important that you review this list and, and be relatively familiar if you're going to be dealing with exports on any sort of significant level to make sure that you check the commodity, the commerce control list to make sure that a license is not required. Okay, so now that we have finished this part of the video, um, you should be able to, to finish the first section of your research, um, but also don't forget to go to the internet and get some ideas regarding how you might design your supply chain uh, for your industry or for your, your particular product. So if you have any questions, please drop me an email and I will be more than happy to help you.